I didn't expect to be affected by the Titanic, but when I found the Titanic, the ground spoke. It was like going to a museum, but there's no guard on duty. And the question is, do we go through that doors of that deep sea museum to appreciate or to plunder? So I arrived at Woods Hall, March 10th, 1967, as a Naval Intelligence Officer and assigned to this deep diving submarine, Alvin. And Alvin was my home for over 25 years. I, I spent many, many years of my life inside this little uh, cocoon, diving to the ocean floor. Amazing series of discoveries that we did chronicled my first article in National Geographic was dive uh, into the Great Rift, was our dive in a project famous, the first uh, manned exploration to the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, I was walking the halls of National Geographic and Sam Matthews back then was the word guy. He was, he was the word guy of the magazine. And he called me into his office, he says, Bob, uh, we're gonna do a big article uh, in, the, in the December 1981 issue of the magazine. And we've written the article, we don't need any help on that, but we want you to sit down with the art department and craft a piece of artwork of a way, your vision of, of the future. How do you really see us moving uh, into the future? And I had actually became convinced that it wasn't through a physical presence, it wasn't through actually diving. I was spending all my time going up and down in a, in a freezing elevator, just as Jim just did in, in, uh, in, in, in Challenger Deep. I think it was six hours, whatever. He spent most of his time in an elevator. And I had spent most of my time in an elevator, and I became convinced that there was a new way of doing things. And this was, this was the piece of artwork that I published in 1981 in the December issue. And the whole idea was to move away from using physical presence to a term I coined called telepresence. And the idea was that if I could replace my physical presence with my spirit and literally have an out-of-body experience and beam myself down, I could then beam myself into my vehicle systems and then my vehicle systems didn't have to come up. And I would be able to work 24-7. So instead of a few hours on the bottom, I could spend 24 hours a day on the bottom. That cartoon became a real design system at Woods Hall called the Argo Jason system. And we began developing this system uh, during, uh, during the uh, Cold War uh, because the Navy had interests not only in exploration and discovery, but in other kinds of programs. Uh, <laughs> And I'll, I'll lift the blanket a little on that one, but I can't lift it fully. But anyway, uh, what was interesting was the first vehicle system I developed was on the NOR and was the Argo vehicle system. The idea was the Argo was my search system, that it would go down and find things, and then once I found things, I would deploy my remotely operated vehicle, Jason. And my passion back then, early on, was to find the Titanic. The Titanic was a, uh, a race was going on, our own Cold War race, in the three blue water oceanographic institutions at the time. The Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Scripps, and the Columbia's University's Lamont Doherty. They were the three, what we call blue water oceanographic institutions that actually could go into the great deep ocean. I wanted to find the Titanic, but I didn't have any funding to find the Titanic because the Navy was not interested in finding the Titanic. They wanted to deal with two submarines we lost during the Cold War, the Thresher and the Scorpion. In the case of the Scorpion, it went down with nuclear weapons. And they wanted me to, to map those, those two sites and to find out what was going on down there because they had two nuclear reactors and wanted to know what they were doing to the environment. And they also wanted to know where those nuclear weapons were and they wanted to know if the Russians had been down there. So uh, we needed a cover for those operations. So I said, well, what about the Titanic as a cover? <laughs> and we decided that we would use the Titanic as a cover and that we would do the missions first. My job was to go out and find, uh, you know, map the Thresher, map the Scorpion, find the torpedoes, the nuclear weapons, and in fact, penetrate inside the submarines uh, to ascertain that. But uh, I had to do them first. So it turns out that when the time came to actually do the hunt, uh, unlike Scripps, which had 60 days to hunt, Lamont had 60 days to hunt, even the French that went ahead of me had 60 days to hunt, I had 12 days. 
to hunt. And so here was the game I had to play. Uh, so here's my vehicle system, and I decided that clearly they were using the wrong approach because they'd all failed. And they, this, was the, this was the search area that we were looking for, and the French had gone in ahead of me, Jean-Louis Michel had gone in ahead of me, he's my co-discoverer of the Titanic, and he went in and did all that white lawn mowing. But the area, when you combine the two boxes, were 150 square miles, and I decided not to look for the ship itself. What I had discovered on the Thresher and the Scorpion is when they had gone down, they imploded. The ships literally turned into a tremendous amount of wreckage. And that wreckage, instead of falling straight down, some of it, the nuclear reactor went straight down because it was so heavy in its containment vessel. But the lighter material was carried off by the currents. And so I decided to, I modeled it, and I figured there had to be a debris field because we knew the currents that night and we knew that there should be carried by the, by the underwater wind. The heaviest objects would be here, the lightest object here. So somewhere in here was this signature. So what I did is I designed my search strategy perpendicular to it, and I divided my spacing just less than the length of our model that we, of, of predicting the debris field. Now, if I had failed, I could have gone back and laced in secondary lines. So here I begin. I began down where we found the, uh, south of the lifeboats, because the lifeboats were the lightest objects that came out of the Titanic. They didn't sink at all. So I cranked in some celestial navigational air, and I, stopped. I figured if I started here, the Titanic had to be to the north. Whenever you search for something, you build these models. The model says it's here. It's never there. Okay, it's never where the model says it is. And if you go to where the model is and it's not there, you're now lost. It's equal up probability in all directions. So always start where it definitely isn't. <laughs> now, I could have started the equator and I knew for sure it was going to be north of that. But I figured if I went south of the lifeboats and added celestial air of five miles and I ran my first line, it couldn't possibly be south of that. So I ran my lines, ran my lines, ran my lines, started to run out of time, and finally, what was really amazing about this whole thing, and this was definitely divine, Jean-Louis Michel, my colleague, said, well, I'm going to mow the entire box, and I'm going to start at the top, and this was his first line, and as he started his first line, the current pushed him slightly south. He missed the Titanic on his first line by less than 300 meters. And I, I, I said, thank you, wind. Because <laughs> he naturally never, he said, well, I'll get to ba back to that later. And he never got back to it. He came that close, the first line. And that's, in fact, where we found it. So it was sort of cool. So this was the moment of discovery. If you, like I say, go on in, the, they did. They did a great job of capturing. We had cameras rolling the whole time. The winter came in on us. We were the window closed in the North Atlantic. We had to wait one year until we could get back. We went back with our submarine Alvin, and we brought with it our first little robotic device called Jason Jr., or JJ. I actually got the Navy to pay for this vehicle, not to go down the grand staircase and film the chandeliers, but to go into the forward torpedo room of the Scorpion. But I couldn't tell anyone about that at the time. <laughs> Years went by. I sat on the sidelines as the salvagers began salvaging her. The films were being made. The Russians were, were offering tour dives to the Titanic. In 2004, many years later, we went back. We went back with Noah's ship, the, the Brown, and we implemented this technology. We moved to another level, and we built a whole new family of vehicle systems, the Argo Jason system. Because in our original model, in our original strategy, was not only to create a telepresence aboard the ship, but with satellite technology to create a telepresence of shore. And that began when we began implementing this a paradigm of exploration that we're now doing with NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration. This is our vehicle system, the Hercules, and its, and its support vehicle, Argus, which provides the powerful lights to light up the real estate down there for the Hercules vehicle system. But the beauty of going back with the ROVs is you can, you can get so close but not touch, and that's a big part of our story. And then we were able to do another very careful survey of the Titanic and created a second mosaic. This was the second mosaic 
shot years after hundreds and hundreds of dives had been made on the Titanic when we made this second mosaic. So we put the two to side by side and we could conceive, certainly the technology and imaging has it changed, but we were able to show you, look, for example, at that big smudge. See that big smudge, that big, they're not here. The smudges are not, see the crow's nest, gone, not there. See all the damage that's been done to the ship. Look at just here. Look at all the holes that are in the ship. This is where the submarines are landing. The, the submarines are landing, and, and they, they, tell, they leave a telltale mark. They take the, the deck is fragile, and when the submarine lands, it crushes it, and it exposes. This is the silhouette of the submarine right here. It crushes the deck, and it exposes. Anytime you see orange, it's a fresh surface brought on by the submarines colliding with the, sh with the ship. You know, I think it's wonderful that people are visiting the Titanic, but I don't think you go to the Louvre and stick your finger in the Mona Lisa. I think the key is to, to develop new protocols. NOAA is working hard to create new protocols. Here's the crow's nest. When we found it, not there now. They said they would never take anything off the Titanic proper. This light fixture is now in their traveling display, it was attached to the mast. You can see the damage done all the places where the submarines are landing. What's interesting is where you look where they can't land, the deck's fine. So you can't blame it on Mother Nature. There, when you look at where the deck can't be landed upon because there's a cable in the way or something, the deck is fine. You see all of this damage. And this is what we documented, and it's just tragic and all the trash. I mean, can't you not at least not drop your trash? Another thing that's being done is when they, the salvagers bring something up, they have to leave an equal weight of garbage behind. So when they bring up an object to compensate for the submarine, the submarine can't get up, it has to leave trash behind. So all around that, they drop chain that is now rusting, they've dropped big bags. This is all left by the salvagers. And right next to them are where the humans came to rest. I just think it's, it's inexcusable to do that to a cemetery. This is a, one of the crew members. This is a, a mother and her daughter who went down together, uh, probably holding hands. So that's sort of the status of it. What we're trying to do is now stop that effort. We hope that you'll support uh, Senator Kerry and his present uh, efforts to introduce new language to the Titanic Memorial Act of 1986, to give it teeth, to give NOAA more jurisdiction on policing the site, we also believe that there's a future to the Titanic. There's no reason to just walk away from it. We now have this incredible technology of telepresence. We were able to uh, broadcast from the deck of, uh, of the Titanic in 2004 uh, from our telepresent technology. We see the future with the Titanic where you'll actually uh, turn it into an underwater museum and be able to visit this. I'm very excited about the Titanic, but I'm equally excited about the ancient history that we're discovering in the ocean that has no name. We have been discovering uh, the ancient mariners have been traveling far from shore. We have now, as of this season, discovered more ancient shipwrecks in the deep sea than any other group on the planet. We've cracked the Rosetta Stone. We know now how to find them. We've estimated that over one million ancient mariners had a bad day. <laughs> and mo many of them have gone into the deep. And so we've been spending the last 15 years in the, in the Mediterranean and in the Black Sea tracking down the ancient mariner. Our first expeditions that we did for the ancient mariners was in the Mediterranean, in the uh, Tyrrhenian Sea. And I had been so enamored by finding the Titanic from its debris field, I found the Bismarck from its debris field, and I got to thinking about the ancient mariner. And I, so I said, okay, let's take the ancient mariner that was making that journey from Carthage to Rome. You know, we know the Carthaginians, which were based in modern day Tunisia, went to war with the Romans. They lost to the Romans in the Punic Wars. They became a vassal state to Rome. And in fact, in the Roman Republic, they became the breadbasket to Rome, supplying the wheat and wine and everything to Rome. How did they get there? Well, the traditional rule of thumb was that the ancient mariner followed the coastline. I had a hard time believing that because, you know, if I was 
a businessman and I wanted to get to Rome, I wouldn't go this way to Rome. <laughs> so I did my most sophisticated analysis I've ever done. I took a ruler and I drew a straight line between Carthage and Rome, okay? And I said, somewhere out here is, a, is an I-95 without an Adopt-a-Highway program for a couple of years. <laughs> because I knew what the ancient mariners were carrying on their ships. Naturally, they carried a prodigious amount of wine. Now, being a sailor, I'm not an archaeologist, but I am a sailor. And I knew that if I was on a ship on a four-day journey from Carthage to Rome, and I had below decks 3,000 bottles of wine, I knew what I was going to do on that trip. <laughs> and knowing that I wasn't supposed to drink that owner's wine, I would throw the object overboard. And so since I know that the deep sea has a very slow sedimentation rate out here in the middle of the Tyrrhenian Sea, it's a centimeter per millennium, I theorized that every Roman empty ever chucked would still be there. <laughs> so I went searching for Roman empties. And I, again, knowing, I, I figured if I'm looking for this line, I'm going to go perpendicular. So I drove literally from Sardinia to Trapani, Sicily, looking for Roman empties. And I found a narrow corridor right here of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of empty wine bottles, Roman wine bottles. They drank for six centuries, and they drank all the way to Rome. Now, finally, I wanted to talk to you about uh, uh, the series of projects that are going on right now. As you know, we've been doing a tremendous amount here with National Geographic. We have the exhibit open. But day after tomorrow, I get in a, on an airplane and I fly to Belfast. And Belfast is really bought into my vision of the future for the Titanic. Belfast is where they built the Titanic. And Belfast was interesting. When I was researching the Titanic, uh, expedition, and I wanted to talk to Harlan and Wolf. They wouldn't answer any of my correspondence. They would not talk to me at all. They've been in seclusion for 100 years. And finally, after 100 years, Duke Abercrombie, one of the members of the royal family that lives in Northern Ireland, called me and asked if I would, if he could come and talk to me. And I said, I'd love to talk to you. And he came and spoke with me. And he said, you know, it's been 100 years that we've never We've basically denied we built the Titanic. We're now going to embrace it through a major project. We want to tell the story of the Titanic. They are opening an exhibit center that is off the charts, $200 million exhibit center in Belfast that opens in just a matter of days to commemorate the building of the Titanic. The exhibit is being done at Harlan and Wolf. This is the actual grain dock, the Thompson grain dock, where they brought the Titanic in, the pump house, where they pumped it out to, to be able to bring in and dry dock the Titanic uh, in that dry dock. And that's where they put on the, the major, the three big screws. This is the Titanic being moved uh, into the Thompson grain dock, where they install these unbelievable propellers on her. And then she sailed. When I was in there, I was amazed because the door, I had a cathartic moment. I, I, my, my, I was in this drying dock, but I came across this wall. This wall is made out of the identical slabs of steel that the Titanic was made out of at the same time. It still has the rivets from her. It was quite amazing to come up to that wall, and I said, if you preserve anything, please preserve this wall. But this is what they're building right now, and this building is just absolutely breathtaking, beautiful. When viewed from above, it's the emblem of the White Star Line. Uh, they've done an, a magnificent job. Uh, I can't wait to see their exhibit that opens on the anniversary uh, on the 15th, but it's quite a spectacular exhibit. They believe in my vision. They have actually built into their new exhibit center in Belfast a theater to be wired in uh, to our ship, uh, the Nautilus, for this coming expedition so that we can eventually bring the Titanic to the world through the use of telepresent technology. Thank you very much.